Hi there, this is an introductory topic video on supply side policies. Keep in mind, of course, the key macro policy objectives of government, keeping inflation under control, achieving steady, sustainable growth of GDP, getting more people back into work and lifting average living standards. Governments often have an objective of improving trade performance on the balance of payments and perhaps achieving a more equitable distribution of income and wealth. We can add to these objectives by focusing on fiscal objectives, balancing the budget, reducing the size of the government national debt. Another objective could be to improve the overall welfare and well-being of the population, and also achieve, to achieve greater regional balance and stability in the economy. There's increased emphasis on improving access to and the quality of key public services, such as education and health and, in the wider picture, maintaining and improving competitiveness in a fast-changing world economy. The environment, of course, is both a threat and an opportunity. Governments increasingly concerned about that. Now, the key point here is that supply-side policies affect nearly all of these key macro objectives. So countries that get the supply-side right nearly always see their overall macroeconomic macro performance improve. So what are supply-side policies? I think generally, supply-side policies, or SSPs for short, aim to increase the productivity and the overall quality of factors of production, and hence increase the productive capacity and capability of an economy. The key point is that supply-side policies focus on getting the structural long-term performance of an economy moving in the right direction. There are different approaches to supply-side reforms, and we'll cover these in this topic video. Some economists favour market-led policies to give the private sector more freedom or more autonomy in the allocation of resources. Other economists favour a more interventionist approach, in particular to overcome what can be persistent and important market failures. Again, some economists favour a mix of free market and interventionist approaches. Our focus is normally on long-run aggregate supply. So that tells us that the time lags involved in introducing supply-side reforms can often be long and uncertain. Here's just a few examples of supply-side policies in action. I'm sure you'll cover many more in your own teaching and learning. The Royal Mail, for example, has been fully privatised in recent years. And the government's introduced a patent box tax initiative, which cuts the rate of corporation tax on the profits of patented products also introduced tax incentives to encourage exploration of shale gas and in recent budgets the main rate of corporation tax has been cut currently 19 percent the aim is to get it to 17 percent by 2020. Other supply side policies include expansion of investment in modern apprenticeships including the youth contract targeting education and human capital for 16 to 18 year olds there have also been some quite significant welfare reforms, including the introduction of a controversial welfare cap. The government has recently launched a national infrastructure plan, which involves a significant number of projects around the country, focusing on transport in particular, and also the launch of the Green Investment Bank, designed to encourage investment into renewable energy. So here are some good examples of supply-side policies in action, and we'll mention a few more in this short topic video. Competitiveness lies at the heart of understanding what supply-side economics is about. The World Economic Forum publishes an annual survey of competitiveness, and in 2015-16, the UK came 10th. So what are some of the objectives of supply-side policies? Well, I've put together here a list of 10 key supply side aims and if you need to jot down some notes just press the pause button and we'll wait for you. I think the key when you're discovering supply side policies is to focus on important supply side words, incentives, enterprise, technologies including innovations, mobility, flexibility and economic efficiency. So supply side policies essentially try to improve incentives for people to look for work and also invest in people's skills in a constantly changing world of work. 
supply side policies aim over time to increase the quality of factors of production and thereby improve labour productivity. And it's important in the modern labour market for workers to be both occupationally and geographically mobile to help reduce structural unemployment. Many supply side policies aim to increase the rate of capital investment in factories, new technologies and what have you, and also to lift the level of research and development spending. Some supply side policies focus on product markets designed to make them more competitive, more contestable, and therefore in time stimulate a faster pace of invention and innovation, both considered important to improve competitiveness. If one gets the supply side right, the platform is built for sustained growth of GDP without necessarily causing inflation. Economists call this non-inflationary growth. Many supply side policies have an enterprise agenda at their heart. They want to encourage the startup and the expansion of lots of new businesses, particularly businesses that could scale up pretty quickly and become major exporters in the future. Overall, supply side policies try to lift a country's trend rate of growth of real GDP. And they do that by increasing the productive potential of the economy, as shown by an outward shift of the PPF. Overall, again, supply side policies aim to improve competitiveness and with it, improved trade performance. And in a world of increasing volatility and vulnerability to climate change, and in a world of increasing macroeconomic uncertainty, if you have a flexible, resilient and diverse supply side, countries are better able to meet the challenges of climate change and macro shocks. So I think this slide hopefully provides with you, for you, some key aims, some key objectives of supply side policies. Here's one of the aims. This shows the rate of unemployment in the UK since 1971. There have been several peaks in unemployment over this time, mainly associated with recession. But notice that each of the peaks in the last three occasions has seen a lower total rate of unemployment. The last peak just over 8%. And this could be taken as evidence that the labour market is performing more efficiently. So perhaps some supply side reforms in the jobs market are starting to bear fruit. So what about pro-market supply side policies? These are policies which essentially try to reduce the size of government and expand the, imp the importance and the influence of market forces in allocating scarce resources. So people who favour pro-market supply-side policies tend to favour cuts in government spending, including welfare caps. They want taxes on business and taxes on employment to be reduced to stimulate investment and to improve work incentives. They favour stripping away some of the red tape, the costs of doing business, including environmental and health regulations. They try to make the labour market as flexible as possible for example, encouraging part-time work and flexible hiring and firing. They're quite tough on competition policy, in particular cartel behaviour. And pro-market policies tend to favour the transfer of assets held by the state, privatised so they're run by the private sector. Pro-market uh, supply-side economists also tend to favour opening up an economy to trade and investment, for example, through cutting tariffs. And also many do favour opening up the economy to the inward flow of skilled workers. Here's an example of the growth of the flexible labour market in the UK, which itself is quite controversial. We see the rise of zero hours contracts in the labour market. Now a zero hours contract is where somebody is not guaranteed a minimum number of hours working each week. In contrast, interventionist or state government driven supply side policies believe in the important role of the government in improving productive potential and capabilities. So these people favour, these economists, favour increased investment in core public services, state education, the National Health Service, and state-run mass transport. Oftentimes they're committed to interventions in the labour market, for example a higher minimum wage or a full-scale living wage to improve the incentive to work. Interventionist economists may argue that progressive taxes on income and wealth are useful not just to reduce inequality, but to generate the revenue to fund public and merit goods. 
interventionist approach also favours a very active regional policy, particularly to drive investment into areas of economic and social deprivation, where per capita incomes are much lower. Some interventionist economists favour selective use of import controls to protect domestic industries, and indeed they may go further and think about management of the exchange rate to improve competitiveness. And some interventionist economists believe that nationalisation is the appropriate supply-side policy, or, if that's not the case, tougher regulation of utilities, key industries. Here's an example of an intervention in the labour market, which we cover in a separate topic video, the economics of the minimum wage and the newly formed national living wage. If supply-side policies work, then it's much easier for governments to achieve over time their key macroeconomic policy objectives. They can, for example, improve the trade-off between inflation and unemployment. See our separate topic video on the Phillips curve. A stronger supply-side performance makes the economy more resilient to external shocks, such as changes in the world price of, of oil and other commodities. If supply-side policies work, per capita income should increase in real terms, and the economy can sustain a faster trend rate of growth. And if labour market policies work, we can get unemployment down by reducing the level of frictional and structural unemployment. Finally, improved supply-side performance should also help a country to achieve a stronger balance of trade in goods and services. So there's a lot resting on supply-side policies. The key is to get the combination of policies right to achieve the desired aims. Potential GDP in the economy is essentially driven by aggregate supply factors. The growth of population, how, how many people are participating in the labour market, the unemployment rate, the, hour, the hours they work, and crucially, as you can see here, hourly productivity. So I go back to what I said at the start, that supply-side policies fundamentally are all about increasing the productivity of factors of production and increasing the productive capacity of the economy. Productivity is key when you're discussing supply-side policies. And one way of showing how an increase in productivity can show through is by an outward shift in long-run aggregate supply. Short-run supply also increases because of lower costs. The key point is that if the economy can increase its productive potential, then it can operate with a higher level of aggregate demand, as shown here by a shift from AD1 to AD2. So this has been an introduction to supply-side policies in developed countries with particular reference to the UK economy.